Yeah, I won't be surprised if this video gets like no views because I've yet to meet someone else that's played these games. Y'all ever experienced a piece of media in your childhood that's so bizarre that you buried in the back of your mind? Like it's too abstract for your young brain to comprehend so you just go back to the shit that you do understand? Well this happened to me way back in 2010 when I first stumbled upon this game. More than a decade later and I still don't know what to make of it. The fact that there's sequels too was wild. What is that game? Well, let me introduce y'all to Xeno Clash. Without a doubt, one of the strangest games I have ever played. It's the first game developed by Ace Team, three brothers out of Chile that worked on this game for a fat minute prior to release. It was originally supposed to be an open world RPG with melee combat, but then they realized that eh, that may be too much to handle for a first project. So they downscaled, managed to land a distribution deal with Steam, and this is what we got. A first person double dragon designed by Salvador Dali. This game must have sold well because it somehow got two sequels that I didn't even know existed until I was making this video. They're pretty damn weird in their own right too with the third game just abandoning the first person fighting for Shaolin showdowns. We'll get to all this later though. For now, what's with this dude's haircut and why is he whooping the asses of all these freaks? I don't know why you did it. Father and mother's children are already coming. Are you listening? Gat! If you stay with me, they might hunt you down too. I know. There he is! <laughs> we'll eat your pan and tough in your skull! Death. Try to resist, Gat! I'll try to open the gate! Welcome to Xenozoink, a strange prehistoric land where motherfuckers look like this. You play as one of these Zenos in Gad, one of the many sons of this hermaphrodite patriarch called Father Mother. The game opens with Gat on the run after supposedly killing Father Mother. After whooping the asses of some of his brothers and sisters, Gat and his companion Deidre try to get as far away from the city as possible. For the rest of the game, the gaps on why all this happened get filled in slowly through flashbacks and other revelations while Gat kicks the asses of anyone that gets in his way. So yeah, I don't know anything else that looks like this game. It's one of the few games where its art style is completely unique, at least in the realm of video games. The environment is obviously on some caveman shit with tribal architecture and a sandy backdrop, but everything else is slightly off to where this game looks like something out of a dream. I don't even know what the fuck I'm even looking at half of the time with these character designs. Apparently the main inspiration for how this game looks is both Warhammer art and Hieronymus Bosch paintings. The the former I don't really see, but the latter, yeah, even before knowing that, the whole vibe of this game reminded me of some of those screwed up renaissance paintings. Surreal as hell, nightmarish, but also kind of goofy. Seriously, what accentuates that last part is how this game sounds, and I'm not even talking about the music yet, I'm just talking about all the weird ass sound effects. <laughs> Most of them are clearly stock, which definitely has you feeling this game's budget, especially with the punch and kick sounds. Would normally be a knock, but it actually enhances the combat. I don't know, there's something about that cartoony slap sound when you punch a dude in the face that's strangely satisfying. Goes back to this game being pretty damn goofy, which I'll go more into when we talk about the combat. Make no mistake about it though, the whole vibe is odd as hell due to the music too. When you're whooping ass, the tracks are appropriately thumping tribal songs that ain't too out of the ordinary. It's when you're simply roaming where these ominous ambient songs play that really makes you feel like you're having a fever dream. Thank you. 
the cherry on top of this bizarre mess is the voice acting, which I can't decide if it's bad or not. It's a weird mesh of certain characters going really hard with alien sounding voices, and then there's other characters that sound like the devs got their untrained friends in the booth. It's funny you decided to follow me, Deidre, because I wasn't going anywhere. So you were going to wait here till your million brothers and sisters got here and killed you? Get up, you Tef. We'll go into the beach or the woods where we can hide. Away from Halston. I'm glad you came, Deidre. Seems now it's my turn to follow you. The delivery of so many of the lines of this game are flat as hell, but I want to be charitable and believe that it was on purpose. Yet another bizarre aspect about this world that we as an audience aren't supposed to fully understand. Maybe in Xenozoic, this is just how they speak. He says hi. He wants to know where you're headed. I need to find Father Mother. He says he can help you. Will you take me to her? I'll let you have my backpack. He wants you to follow him. But enough about the weird aesthetics, that's only part of what made this game stand out. You see these fisticuffs flying? The look may be experimental, but how this game plays is pure unga bunga. You lay the smack down on enemies while they try to lay the smack down on you. Think any beat em up where you got some combos, blocks, and dodges to whoop ass. The obvious difference is the first person perspective which does have things feeling a bit different. You jab with the corresponding mouse buttons, weave with spacebar, combine the two for counter attacks, hooks, and other stuff. The name of the game is to wail on opponents enough so they become fatigued. Once their guard's down, that's when you can really lay into them. Molly whop them with an uppercut or lay in some stiff shots while grabbing them. It ain't the deepest combat, especially with no more added moves and barely any power progression, but the sheer act of knocking bitches out in this game is still entertaining as hell. Punching dudes yards away and having them ragdoll not only makes you feel badass, but it's also a funny visual. The fighting in this game is just chaotic as hell. You're often getting wailed on by like two or three guys at a time, and the limited camera, along with the shitty lock-on system, means that your only hope in dealing with this is throwing out all types of haymakers. Sounds janky as hell, right? And trust me, it is. The whole game definitely needed more time in the oven. However, this is one of those games where its unpolished nature Nature actually makes things a bit more fun. These fights really feel like messy street fights where you're scrambling to knock out the ops. Doubly so with this stamina meter here which limits how many punches you can throw out. It's meant to not have the player be so strong to the point where they trivialize the combat but I do think that this tiny ass bar was a bit too restrictive. It seems like you're gasping for air after just one combo. Some more leeway to go apeshit with your fists would have been better especially since a lot of the enemies you face have pretty sizable health bars and waiting around for the stamina meter so much does slow down the pace. I guess that's what these weapons are for which just demolish everything but you get disarmed pretty quickly. I hate the fact that the only reliable way to take down these brutes is with a club and even then in order to not get demolished you have to bait their attacks out to get some safe hits in. It's also weird how you're only able to hit enemies in the head despite the first person point of view. You could be looking at the feats of enemies and your hits will always go for the head. Did the devs forget that body shots were a thing in fighting? Can't help but feel like a whole dimension is missing from the combat by not being able to do this. Not only does it look stupid, it just doesn't make sense. If a dude is covering up a lot, then the body is the next thing you go for. Also, the boss fights definitely leave much to be desired. You would think in a game like this, the bosses would be these epic hand-to-hand -hand contests, but nah. It's mostly just shooting them down. I guess it's not that big of a deal since this game is only two and a half hours long. Yeah, you heard me right. This game is the length of a demo. Not that that's a bad thing. This game manages to pack quite a bit in its movie length runtime. Obviously, a lot of it is filled with bomb bombastic fights, but this game does have quite a bit of levels. Mechanically, there's not much variety in these levels as there's barely any puzzles or exploration, but artistically and narratively, this game always keeps it moving. The game's so short to the point that you don't get a chance to get tired of it. Weirdly enough, the least weird thing about this game is the story, which is pretty straightforward. Gat and his lady friend are on the run due to knowing Father Mother's secret. 
They meet this dude named Golem who can help them out, and then they make their way back to Hailstump to defeat Father Mother. How it's told is a little odd with whole flashback levels being spliced in at weird moments, but it does fill in the gaps of why they're exiled. The weirdness of Xenozoic and its inhabitants are definitely doing the heavy lifting and drawing me in though. Gat's extremely monotone monologues don't really sell the emotion of what's going on, so it's a bit hard to be invested in its plight. This game also does the thing I hate where more strife than necessary happens because a character doesn't share some information. In the case of this game, it's Gat knowing Father Mother's big secret that could ruin her relationship with her kids. If Gat just told that secret to his siblings and explained himself, then he wouldn't even need to go through all this shit. It's clear that this is just part one of this tale though, as there's a lot not explained in the end there, with Golem not being relevant in this game too much. Golem's speech at the end there even gets cut off. Luckily, there actually was a second game that followed this one. But yeah, that's the first Xenoclash, a game so abstract that it stuck with me all these years later. A unique beat-em-up that's still pretty unique. It's pretty rough around the edges, but it's still a pretty enjoyable playthrough. If this game looks even remotely interesting to anyone, it's only 10 bucks on Steam and it's frequently on sale for like $2. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about this. On to the next one. So if I didn't tell you this was the sequel, you'd probably think it was still the same game, wouldn't you? Expected more of an overhaul after four years, but I guess it wasn't needed since the first game was mad different from everything else on the market. They already had a fun gameplay hook, so all they really needed to do was refine, which is what they sorta did. This one doesn't seem to be as remembered as the first. I guess the gap between the first game had tempered the interest people had in this series. It definitely did for me because making this video is how I even discovered this game's existence. After playing through it for this video, I gotta say, while I enjoyed it, I wasn't really missing all that much all these years later. I'll get into why I say that later. For now, what's going on in this one? What's going on with Gat and his friends since laying the beat down on Father Mother in the last game? So Xenoclash 2 takes place not too long after Xenoclash 1. However, things in Hailstem have changed quite a bit. That golem Gat saved in the first game? Yeah, he goes by Caxday now and rules over the town. Realizing that this place is a lawless hellhole, he actually tries to enforce some laws around this bitch and even goes as far as linking himself to everyone in town so they feel whatever physical pain he does. He arrests Father Mother for all the baby kidnapping he did in the last game, but instead of just throwing away the key, he actually gives Gat and his sister Remont a chance to defend Father Mother in a trial. And if you've been paying attention to the story from the last game, you're probably like, wait a minute, didn't Gat try to kill him in the last game? And the answer to that is yes, but the feelings after are complicated. In order to prepare for this trial, Gat and Remont travel all around Xenozoic to find some of their other brothers and sisters to prepare. And to say that they get into all types of shit is an understatement. So, different engine, but luckily the same surreal prehistoric art style is still intact. I semi-roasted this game earlier by not having any visual improvements over the first game, but that's not completely true. Graphically, this game is about on par with the first, but the character models and environments do look a bit more polished here. That's mostly due to the much improved lighting. The brightness has been turned down a bit with more dynamic shadows, which has these lands looking a bit more grounded. At least, you know, as grounded as Xenozoin can be. I still don't know what the fuck I'm even looking at half of the time. And with this game shifting to a more open world, there's more freaks than ever before to punch in the face. The vibes are still odd as hell too, and that's largely due to the soundtrack, which is still on some creepy ambient shit during the down moments, and on some jungly Jack and Daxter vibes during the fights. <laughs> Thank you. 
also oddly plays Fire Emblem sounding music. The voice acting is still pretty awkward, but at this point, I just take it as this being how they talk in Xenozoink. Audio quality is still kind of shit, though. You got some characters that sound like they voice their lines through a proper studio mic, and then you got other characters that sound like they recorded their lines through their laptop speakers. Cat Gat, you're in bad shape. You got into a fight you shouldn't win. You like that, don't you? Well, it made it easy for me to find you. What's this about? It's about punching people in the face, so you'll like it. I need to know you can fight if you're going to help me get Father Mother out of the jail. So I, uh... I'm not gonna ask for your help. Either you help me, or you don't. Brother and all, I still think you're a prick. But fuck all that. Is smacking down Zenos here as enjoyable as the last game? Yeah. For the most part, yeah. How the combat worked in the first game was brought over with only minor changes. Each fist is now mapped to the corresponding mouse buttons and we got some new moves to work with. Charge punches, charge kicks, double fists, and even an air juggling combo that I never got down. Is it just me or is this combo hard as hell to pull off? Anyway, the combat has been polished up a bit this time around with the lock-on system actually functioning and a more consistent dodge. This already makes the combat here way less frustrating since you now reliably perform moves. The sheer act of knocking the soul out of dudes and seeing their bodies fly yards away is still incredibly amusing, but it ain't as amusing as it was in the first game. The reason is the lack of chaos. You have more punches to work with, but you quickly find out that you don't need to use any of them because simply stomping on enemies wipes them out the quickest. Even the game advises you to do this, which means how fights usually go is you hitting a guy with a strong attack and then stomping him out until he's deceased. What makes this worse is the passivity of enemies in this game. I don't even know why they even bothered with a block button in this game. You're barely going to use it with how long it takes for these guys to throw out hits. I get polishing up the player's moveset, but nerfing enemies this much made this game way too easy to the point of it getting a bit boring midway through. That and the open world, which really dragged the pacing. Yeah, Ace Team opted in for a Borderlands style open world where there's several spacious zones separated by load screens and flat out, this was a mistake. There's so much backtracking and just walking period. This game gives the vaguest directions on where to go too, which means that the likelihood of getting lost is pretty high even with a map. Would it be too bad if there were things to explore out here, but there's not. And the most annoying part is the respawning enemies every time you enter the area again. Am I supposed to fight these guys every time? Because I think not. It's crazy how some changes can really bring down the experience, but it's not that I flat out dislike this game. There were definitely some additions that freshened things up. You got this fancy watch where you could do things like link two enemies together and do damage to both at once, which is fun to mess around with. There's actually some sort of power progression in this one with some skill point gains you can put into health, stamina, and damage and the like. Would be lying if I said I actually felt any power gains since this game is already piss poor easy, but with the length tripling, there definitely needed to be some sort of gains. Remot tagging along in fights is mostly for the new co-op feature, which is always fun, but you can also call her into battle along with other recruited folks for fights. This actually adds some of that needed chaos I was griping about, but having assistance already makes a piss easy game easier. I think it's about time I use my proper name. I am Zotelte. You must know why the Golem sent us here. Do you have a cure? No, you are looking for him. What killed him? Just like my friend in the island, he was dying of boredom. Yes, of boredom. You would understand if you had lived as long as he did. 
I will say that the narrative is a bit more interesting this time around. Consequences of what happened in the last game get carried over along with some new unexpected twists that really flesh out the world of Xenozoic a bit more. Still not in love with any of the characters, but I do like the whole theme of order versus chaos that comes up. Hailstone would probably be a better place to live if there were actually some laws and ethics to civilized people, but Caxday, an outsider just taking charge and throwing bitches in jail, yeah, that's probably not the way to do it. How things are framed, it's clear that this game wants you to side with chaos, or I guess the better term here is freedom. Caxton and the other golems are so condescending about their civilized ways being above the savage Xenos, but when you take a peek into their world, it looks like a depressing prison. Not to mention, at least from what we see in this game, the relationships between the golems seem to be very cold and based on performance. Meanwhile, you have father and mother out here creating a connection family with people that aren't even related. The way he went about it was fucked, but he does face the consequences for it. And Gat learns that being blood related to those you consider family doesn't really matter that much. Would be interesting if a third game had Gat battling against more of the golems now that we know they're a threat, but I guess at that point it wouldn't be Xenoclash. But yeah, that's Xenoclash 2. A decent follow up with some big misses. I did not care for the open world in this game at all, to the point where I don't really have any desire to pick this up again. It ain't bad, but just playing the first game gives you the gist on why these games are special. Would have been the end of Xenozoink until Ace Team just randomly revisited the world in another release. So weak. You killed him. Get out of here, Hermit. This is none of your business. I have another artifact. You don't want to end up like the old man. I don't have any dice. Then I've already won. I get to eat you first. One of those sentences is true. Yeah, now we get into the out of place one. I was debating if I should even talk about this one since it's completely different from the other games, but apparently it is officially a part of the Xenoclash series. It takes place in Xenozoink and is made by the same guy, so what the hell. This one is pretty damn new coming out just last year. Crazy thing is, I've seen this game around Steam here and there, and thought it had a cool looking art style and gameplay, but I wasn't sold due to the look of the main character. I'm sorry y'all, I like being a dick in games sometimes, but not an actual dick. Looking back though, it was my loss because this ended up being a true hidden gem. With this game, Ace Team took a bunch of popular modern day mechanics and somehow combined them into something unique. Once again, these motherfuckers created something that feels like nothing else on the market. Which is even more of an accomplishment now than it was 15 years ago. What's super dope about it too was that the essence of the previous games still live on in this. The perspective may have shifted, but you're still laying the smackdown on Xenos in different ways, which is what I'm here for, baby. But before we get into that, what's with this dickhead and the bird on his shoulder? I'm looking for someone who can come in. The gate's open. I'm just waiting for a messenger. If you have business, go inside. If you don't, go away. Either way, I don't care. Well, I hope y'all didn't like Gad and friends because they are nowhere to be seen here. Nah, Clash Artifacts of Chaos is a soft reboot where we play as Pseudo, a Zeno vagabond that one day encounters an old man getting the brakes beaten off of him in an artifacts duel. Pseudo avenges this man by fighting after him and meets the old man's grandson who's now an orphan. Feeling bad for the little guy, Pseudo volunteers to guide the boy to others who can watch over him. As you can guess, that ain't so easy. They come across this powerful figure named Gemini that wants to use the boy's powers for himself. And this quickly becomes a nationwide journey to gather artifacts to stop that asshole. Are we sure this is still Xenozoink? Because god damn, this actually looks like a pleasant place to live. Vibrant, lush, full of green. 
There's still some rocky flintstone looking areas, but it is not the norm anymore. And even these areas still have way more life to them than in the previous games. Part of that is the more vibrant color palette, but also the pencil like sketching on everything. If the previous games felt like a fever dream, this one feels like a goddamn kid's storybook. Feels really warm, but there's an undercurrent of nightmare fuel with the bizarre character designs and environments. The geography in this game makes no damn sense, but that's also what makes this world pretty interesting to explore. Suffice to say, this is one of those games that's going to look good for a very long time. I really dig the look of this. The tunes have also changed up a bit to match the vibes. Instead of strange ambience and jungle music, we got a mixture of grandiose choir songs and nothing at all. Seriously, it's either final boss music or diegetic sounds. There's some chill background songs here and there, but there were more moments than expected of the game wanting you to just take in the atmosphere. It's all good either way. You could tell over the decade that Ace Team had leveled up as a studio because we no longer have to deal with stiff voice acting. Nah, the voices are pretty good all around this time. Almost too good because whoever voiced the boy was annoying me at points like an actual kid. Pseudo, I'm cold. But y'all have eyes and ears, I don't really need to explain this game's presentational wins too much. What is a bit different this time around is how this game plays. As you can see, the first person point of view has been done away with in favor of the good old over the shoulder third person camera angle that many modern games seem to be in love with. The first person beatdowns are still present, but only as a special attack when this bar gets full. Yeah, your reward for playing this game well is the first two games combat system. Not gonna lie, I was originally disappointed by this at first, but I grew to dig it as a stylistic choice. It's like you're so in the zone now with complete focus on taking down your opponent. The flashy finishing moves at the end is also pretty dope. The name of the game is mostly still the same that you're laying the beat down on opposing Zenos with punches, kicks, and dodges and the like, but man, there's way more to the combat here than in any of the other games thus far. I won't say the learning curve is steep, but there's some things you need to get down. This is not a beat em up where you can wail on your opponent endlessly, hell nah. Directional dodging, parrying, feinting, and positioning are all things you need to get down. How you deal with opponents is pretty methodical, especially with fights being three on one affairs and sometimes more. You're more than capable to deal with all this though, with different fighting stances and stat gains you get. On pure game feel, the combat feels great with every hit having a nice impact with fairly fluid combos, but this game also has a surprising amount of depth. You have combos, but unlike other beat em ups, it's not really about learning them and spamming them out, nah. It's more about maneuvering around enemies and reacting to what they throw. And the reason for this is because you take a big chunk of damage in this game and groups are pretty damn aggressive. However, that's what makes the fighting in this game pretty fun. Staying on your toes and using all the defensive options I listed earlier to find pockets to get your hits in. Being able to cancel your attacks mid-attack and go into another movement sounds like such a minor mechanic, but it really does a lot to open up what you can do. Along with duck attacks being able to whiff, you have more freedom than in most games in how you can read and react to what mobs throw at you. And there's also the fact that enemies actually have friendly fire on, so you can always position yourself to where enemies are accidentally taking each other out. But the fighting on its own isn't what makes this game all that unique compared to the rest. Nah, it's what comes before the fighting. By the one law, I challenge you to the ritual. The reason this game is called Artifacts of Chaos is due to the One Law, a dice game that the game incentivizes you to play before initiating combat. 
So both you and your opponents have these things called artifacts, right? They're essentially tools that can give either you or your opponent an advantage in the fight ahead. Shit like being able to hit your opponent for big damage first, to fogging up the whole arena, to being contained to a small area, and more. However, to use an artifact, you first have to win the ritual game, which consists of rolling dice and using these things called chacks to manipulate the opponent's dice. Whoever ends up with the highest number wins and has to face the consequence of whatever artifact their opponent chose. As you can guess, this adds a whole new dimension to the combat. Some artifacts can really fuck you over if you lose these ritual games, which is probably going to happen often as it always seems like enemies have either more dice than you or better checks. These assholes are smart as hell too, they always go with the most practical move. I was losing so much regularly that halfway through the game, I threw my hands up and decided to just let the boy do these automatically. Didn't change the results much. Despite my failures though, I really dig these as they add a welcome amount of unpredictability to each fight without being too harsh. If you nail down the fundamentals of the combat, you can fight your way out of anything and it feels even more badass if the situation is something serious. I don't really know why this game gets the label of Souls-like, I swear motherfuckers see a level up or spawn checkpoint and a stamina bar and act like the Souls games invented that shit. Apparently Bloodborne was a big inspiration for the level design here, but I don't really see it. The level design in that game was esoteric as hell. Here you got five regions that are separated into an easily understandable way with a central town in the middle. Regions even wrap into each other for some interconnectivity, but it seems like a wasted effort since you never need to travel from region to region. You're always heading back through the town as that's just the fastest way. But going back to the Souls-like talk, even with some similar mechanics, this game is still pretty damn different in those mechanics. Like in a typical Souls-like, when you die, you lose experience points, but you have a second chance to get them back. You have an infinite number of retries though, and you can smash your head against something with no no real consequence other than your diminished sanity. Here when you die, you get a second chance to revive yourself in the skeletal form at night, but if you die again, it's game over and you lose a painful amount of progress. Some of these walkbacks are brutal, but even more brutal are entire shortcuts you unlock not being saved. So if you don't find a nearby campsite, you can find yourself going through a whole level again. I get the walk back needs to be here as there needs to be some sort of punishment for dying, but man, being forced to do fights you've already won again sucked ass. So I've been singing this game's praises and I do think that much of this game is pretty good, but it ain't without flaws. I definitely have some issues here. For one, the camera sucks ass when it comes to fighting larger enemies. You can't see what they're doing and it makes every fight against these goliaths more frustrating than fun. The game forgets to tell you about parrying which admittedly isn't as useful as dodging but still useful on occasions. Also dodging itself does feel unresponsive at times. The backtracking in this game is just brutal. There is so much walking back through areas you've been through with no changes. Worst thing about this are the damn loading screens which were long as hell. Yeah nah, this game definitely needed some fast travel between campsites, at least one point in each region. I like that you have the choice to either play the ritual game or not, but it doesn't really make sense that the other Xenos don't initiate it. What's really annoying is this game slowing you down and forcing you to fight a guy even if they don't see you. I haven't really talked about the nighttime exploring when Pseudo turns into the skeletal figure, but that's because it's mostly just used to open up the way for Pseudo in his fleshy form. Apparently enemies are tougher in this phase, but I didn't really feel it. Oh, now you talk. All this time, Pseudo, I was guided by a philosophy. The truth of my silence, my compliance with Gemini- oh. It was better when you didn't talk. <laughs> Man, games really do love these types of stories, don't they? You know, the rough hardened man getting softened up by traveling with an enthusiastic child. Without even name dropping him, you're probably thinking of the same games I am. And just like those other games, it hits once again here. 
seeing an apathetic Sudo grow close to this bird boy and eventually taking on the role of his father was way more wholesome than I was expecting. What I really like is that it doesn't totally play out as you expect. Even though in the beginning Sudo was reluctant about traveling with this kid, he's not openly antagonistic towards him like those of his archetype usually are in stories like this. Nah, Sudo was that uncle that had to abruptly watch over their nephew while their parents needed to step out for something. He doesn't want to do it, but he doesn't want to see the kid suffer more, so he's got to do it. Their relationship throughout the game grows as you would expect, but what I really like about this game is that it had the balls to not have it work out in the end. Don't know if it's left like this for a possible sequel, but either way, the events that unfold were incredibly poignant. Don't want to spoil anything, as I do want people to actually give this game its shine and experience it for themselves. Despite all the weird looking creatures and constant fighting, Clash Artifacts of Chaos is a very human story about one finding their purpose. Most won't relate to Sudo whooping the asses of everyone in front of them, but the feelings of living without purpose and not wanting to be alone is widely relatable. I gotta say I grew fond of this dickhead and I hope to see his return in the future if Ace Team ever returns to the series. I thought you'd left me. Never. What happened? I had the strangest dreams. Don't worry about it. Everything will be alright. I'll stay with you and protect you. So yeah, that's Artifacts of Chaos and the Xenoclash series as a whole. What weird games, but I'm grateful for their existence because it just shows how far you can take games in a particular style. Anybody that says that games lack originality these days, show them the third game and they'll sing a different tune. I had my criticisms for the second game, but I still find it more interesting than most. The games surrounding it, I still think are worth playing at the time of this video. Especially the third game. The third game has slept on heavy. It won't be everyone's cup of tea, but shit. If anything here has piqued your interest, it can be copped on Steam for a low cost. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about this. If you liked this video, I got plenty of other gaming reviews and retrospectives to bite into. Do all the things to help this video out in the algorithm, and I'll see y'all next time. Oh.